All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. We're going to get started right on time. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming to the conference. I want to thank uh, Penn State for having me and for putting on this wonderful conference. Hopefully, everyone had enough to eat at lunch. And presenting right after lunch is always interesting because you get the food comas and people nodding off. Um, I see some familiar faces in the audience. My name is Mike Boyle, and for those of you that don't know me, this afternoon, we're going to explore what's in a name by taking a deeper look um, into the DNS system. So I work for Robert Morris University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're a pretty small department, so we all get to do many different things, but primarily I'm the Mac and VoIP admin at the university. Um, I'm at M. Boyle on Twitter, and if any of you know Chris Daw, uh, he's at the conference. This is a little insight into my personal life. Uh, statistical study of the synergies leverage in the Venn diagram of Volvo bartenders and local politics. My guy won last night for mayor, so I was pretty excited about that. Who's that? Bill Caduto. Ran for the mayor of Pittsburgh and won the party night. So. All right, so we have a lot to cover this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to try and leave time at the end for questions. We're going to look at DNS in a nutshell, cover it from an architectural standpoint. And then we'll briefly cover some common DNS scenarios that might be used in your environment. Uh, then we'll look at the command line tools available in Mac OS X to troubleshoot DNS. Um, and finally, we'll look at how DNS is implemented in OS X server. Not necessarily because you'll use it, maybe you will, but it provides a good way to sort of visualize the things that I talk about during the presentation. So let's get started. So, I don't have a fancy clicker. Uh, at the most basic level, DNS is like the phone book of the internet, right? Before information was so easily accessible online, if you wanted to find the phone number for your local tire shop, you'd have to pull out the yellow pages, go to tires, look for the name of the company, and next to that name would be a number. The DNS system at its most basic level serves that same function. So here's a visual example. Um, a user is on their Mac, they type apple.com into their browser, it gets translated into a 17 dot address. Apple owns the whole 17 slash 8, if you didn't know that. So anything that's 17, starts with 17, belongs to Apple. Then a bunch of networking stuff happens that we're not going to talk about. And then Apple.com magically loads in the browser. If the internet's working, so not on AT&T Wi-Fi. <laughs> so Apple.com is translated to, in this case, 17.172.224.47. This is the part that we're going to focus on today, is how this happens. There's so much involved um, with the DNS system that I can't possibly go in depth into every single aspect, but I'm going to cover these things on the slide. Um, and there's also the RFC Wikipedia articles. O'Reilly has a really good DNS and bind book that I'll mention at the end of the presentation. But I do want to cover the most important parts, which are on the slide. Queries, resolvers, name servers, resolution from root, caching, zones and records, delegation, forwarding, and there's a ton more. But let's look at queries first, because queries are really at the heart of DNS. When you type apple.com into your browser, that's really issuing a query. And a query is, to put it simply, sort of like asking, at what address is apple.com located? Or perhaps a more complex query might be, uh, where are the domain controllers uh, in my Active Directory environment? Or um, where are my Kerberos records, like, are my domain controllers serving out Kerberos correctly? You can find that in DNS. Um, or this, even this email looks like it came from my domain. Does it, act, did it actually come from my domain? Can I verify that? A lot of that is handled in DNS. There's two main types of queries, recursive and iterative queries. First, we'll look at recursive. So a recursive query is usually made by a client host, which could be your Mac, for example. And it's asking a DNS server for an answer to a question such as, at what address is apple.com located? Or please kindly give me an error if you don't know no, the answer. The DNS server that is queried has to respond one way or the other. And unlike an iterative query, which we'll look at next, the DNS server can't tell your Mac to go ask somewhere else. Okay? So that's, that's a really basic query. So let's look at iterative query. This is usually made uh, by a DNS server. And this is one in which a DNS client allows the server to return the best answer that it has or uh, refer to another. So if the server doesn't have an exact match, the best possible information that it can return is a referral to another DNS server. 
So the DNS client can then query that referred server, and it continues until it locates uh, a DNS server that's authoritative for the domain that you, uh, that you asked for, or an error or a timeout if that happens. So the best way to compare these two really is to, to illustrate them. So let's look at a simple illustration of uh, a recursive query. This is a Mac, and let's say this is a name server in my environment. This Mac issues a recursive query to the RMU name server for what is www.rmu.edu. Because the name server knows the address, it returns it to the client, which in this case is 66206178.109. Please don't need off our website. Now, walking the tree is a phrase that is tightly linked to iterative query, um, and it refers to what happens when a name server starts issuing um, the query starting at the root DNS servers, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But let's just illustrate how this works. There's a lot more servers on this page. Um, the client Mac is querying the army name server for host.example.com. This is just a made-up address, a uh, made-up name. This is a recursive query. Because the army name server doesn't have the answer, it contacts an authoritative name server for the internet, which is known as a root DNS server, for the name. Okay, and then because uh, it wasn't because it wasn't in the army name server's cache to ask the root, and then the root response responds with a referral to a .com top level domain name server, and then the army name server goes and iteratively asks the .com name server for post.example.com. It also doesn't know the answer, so it responds with a referral to the example.com name server. It's the army name server then goes and iteratively asks it. And because example.com's name server is authoritative for example.com, it's able to return the result, which is my IP address, which then the army name server finally passes back to the possible. The reason I'm using Mac Minis is because all DNS servers on the internet are Mac Minis. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely not true, uh, but, you know. So, to be more specific then, from an architectural standpoint, DNS follows a client-server model. Um, I've been saying client-host, but really it's a piece of software called, called a resolver that issues the query. So a resolver is simply that. It's a piece of software that issues queries. On OS X, there are name resolution libraries that um, handle this. And name servers are for servers um, with DNS information, which can include zone data, um, records, caches, and more. And we'll explore these things. So let's look at zones. When thinking of the DNS system, it's appropriate to think of it um, as a tree graph or even as a file system where you start with slash for root and then you continue to go down and down and down further into a, a folder hierarchy. Or as a tree graph, you start at root and then you go down to the next level and then you keep going down. I have an illustration on the next slide. Uh, but each zone can consist of one or multiple domains or multiple subdomains. And then subdomains can even be delegated to different servers, um, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And then each zone contains resource records, which are associated to a name. And that's, that's really the meat of uh, DNS. So here's, here's an illustration. Uh, it's a lot, on the, a lot on the screen, but uh, at the very, very top is what would be the root DNS servers, and I'll illustrate those in a little bit. But each dash area is like a zone of authority, which is managed by a name server. So your name servers are authoritative for a domain. Like Robert Morris, our name servers are authoritative for the army that you use domain. So we would have uh, one of those you know, dash lines around our cluster. And then where it says zone delegation there, that's, uh, you know, let's say we have, uh, I'll, I'll illustrate this later, but we have mac.army.tu, which is delegated to me. So in this illustration, that would be, I would be kind of down there in the bottom, the bottom of our corner. And each one of those yellow blocks is a resource that produces a name, so that could be uh, post.example.com or something about Mac that I that you use. So those are records. And there are tons and tons and tons of different DNS record types, but the most common that you'll see are A. I threw quad A in there last night because there's a session on IPv6 here. That's coming up. The DNS is important and relevant to that. We have C names, MX records, NS records, PTR, SOA, SPF, SRV, and text. These are the most common. A records simply link uh, a name to a number. 
Claude is IPv6 equivalent of that. C name is like an alias, so you have post.example.com or post2.example.com points to post.example.com. MX records are used for mail. They define how mail is handled for a domain, and they include um, numbers to indicate priorities for mail servers and which one should be contacted with you first, second, third, etc. Um, NS records are used to define the name servers for a given uh, zone. PTR are used for reverse DNS, which we'll talk about. SOA is the start of authority record, which is at the top of a, of a DNS zone file. I'll show you that when we look at uh, OS and server DNS. SPF is used for spam. SRV or service records, which uh, are heavily, heavily linked to things like LDAP and Kerberos. I'll also show that. And hex records basically can hold anything, but they're also still used um, commonly to hold SPF information. Even though there's its own record type, a lot of times that information is stored um, in, in text records. Let's look at uh, the name server portion of the DNS system. So name servers contain zone files that hold the DNS record information. So for example, the RMU name servers hold the zone files for the RMU.edu zone. We'll talk more about zones. Name servers for efficiency cache query results. And those are defined, the TPL or time to live defines how long those uh, results are able to be cached. If a resolver queries the same name server for a record before that TPL has expired, it just returns it right away. It never, uh, it never tries to go and retrieve it from an authoritative name server again. It just provides what it has in its cache. Name servers can contain other name server records uh, to delegate control over subdomains. So again, at Robert Morris, like I have control over mac.army.edu, ad.army.edu goes to Active Directory. And then they can also contain forwarding information for what's called unauthoritative queries. So if, if I don't have that name, where do I send this query to or not at all? The domain name system is distributed and fault tolerant. So one of the ways that this is achieved is through redundancy in the servers hosting the zone files. A DNS zone must always have one uh, primary name server, but a zone can have any number of additional uh, slave DNS servers. And when changes are made uh, to the zones on the primary, for example, you change the name that's associated with an IP address, the primary notifies the slave of changes, and then the zone file is transferred over TCP port 53. Uh, regular DNS queries will come over UDP port 53, so you can firewall your TCP 53 just to um, the boxes that are going to be um, receiving your zone file if you do replication like this. By default, uh, systems like bind DNS allow zone transfers to all, and that's kind of a security risk because it will show you sort of the internal structure of your organization. You can receive a copy of that zone file and see all the different name members. So securing that is, is important. So there's a special group of DNS servers called the roots. Um, oops, no, <laughs> not those guys. There are 13 uh, root name servers around the world. I say 13 because there's really not just 13 um, Nine of the servers are geographically dispersed around the world. They're load, they're load balanced, nine of them through something called any path routing, and the others are load balanced through other means, maybe hardware load balancing, I'm not, not quite sure. The root servers serve a single purpose. They publish something called the root server zone file, which simply lists the addresses of all of the authoritative name servers for top level domains. So .com, .net, .org, .edu. The list goes on and on because now they're basically, I think they're accepting, uh, you can apply for any top level domain or top access that sort of thing now. So it publishes the list of the name servers for those top level domains that would be used in that walking the tree process. So here's a map of where they are. This is taken from the, the rootservers.net website. You can see they're all over the world for redundancy and speed purposes. All 13 of them. Yeah, there. So that's what when I said 13. Yeah. So there's. You see, like L. There's really. There's tons of L's. It's not just really 13, but the the name is L. <laughs> Let's talk about um, delegations of forwarding. 
So DNS provides the option of dividing up the namespace into um, one or more zones, which can be stored, distributed, replicated to other DNS servers. Delegation is usually used to delegate management over part of your DNS to another part of your organization. Um, I mentioned this, but again, that Robert Morris, Mac.rmw, is delegated to me. Forwarders are usually used to send non-authoritative queries to other name servers. So when a resolver queries a forwarding DNS server, the record's not in its database or not in its cache, um, it sends the query to a forwarder, waits a very short period of time, and then if it doesn't get a result back, it starts that walking the tree process and goes out and tries to find, um, find the name. The forwarders are also useful if you need to stop name resolution to a particular name server. Um, so for example, if, you, if only one of your DNS servers in your organization has access to the internet, you can configure your other DNS servers to forward queries to it so that they can resolve names that are outside of the here's a, here's a kind of a trick question, I guess, for people that know a little bit about DNS. Is this a fully qualified domain name post of example.com? No. Thank God. All right. This is good. So technically, it's not, although in you know casual day-to-day -day conversation, we might say that it is. But notice the trailing dot at the end of this. Post.example.com was not a fully qualified domain name, but post.example.com dot is. Trailing dot represents the DNS root that we just talked about. A fully qualified domain name, this is what it is. It's an un unambiguous name that specifies its position in the DNS tree absolutely, including that trailing period. Uh, or root pointer. They're sometimes called a rooted domain. They have a max length of 256 bytes. And this is the interesting thing, is that browsers and most name resolution libraries handle this trailing dot for you. You don't even know that it's happening. So if you type www.apple.com dot in your browser, it will load apple.com. That's really what it's looking for. Let's look at the anatomy of this. I started making these slides around Easter, um, so <laughs> it kind of explains the goofy colors on this. But so this is right, left, uh, right to left. We'll start at the right, and you see the dot there. That's the root pointer highlighted in white. And then we have the top level domain, which is .com. And then we have the second level domain, which is .example, example. And then there could be any additional number of subdomains after that. And then finally on the left is what we're asking for, which is the host uh, for resource name. So to think of that walking the tree, the root, and then the top level domain servers, and then the servers for example.com will give us the result for us. Everything we've looked at thus far has been translating names into numbers, but there's a really other important piece of DNS that talks about how numbers are translated into names, and that's through something called Reverse DNS. So reverse DNS utilizes a special zone called the dot in dash ADDR dot ARPA zone. Um, the records themselves are called PTR records, and they're sort of kind of read right to left. Um, so for example, if apple.com is translated into 17.172.224.47, if we're going to have reverse DNS for that, the IP address flips around, so 47.224.172.17.inadr.arpa is apple.com. That's a quote, what's going on there? But I don't know who made the format, and IPv6 is a little bit different. I didn't include it on the slide because it's super long, but the address sort of doesn't flip, but there's a, a dot. You can't, you can't use the IPv6 abbreviated format in reverse DNS. The whole IP address is included in the record. So I did not include that on the slide. But it's absolutely critical if you're using OS10 server. It's critical for all OS10 server services. It's also used by mail servers um, as a rudimentary way of checking to see if the domain name is being uh, spooked. And reverse DNS is also one half of something called forward confirmed reverse DNS. That sounds super, super fancy, but basically it means if you take an IP address, <laughs> do a reverse lookup on it and get its name. And then you look up the name and you get an IP address. If that initial IP address you look for, uh, for the name matched the IP address that you got when you looked up the name, then you have a forward confirmed uh, reverse DNS entry. 
And that's what OS10 Server uses to populate the hosting field as you're setting up the setting up server. So I will show that in the demo. And what happens if you don't build it? So this is something I want to talk about because RMU got burned by this not too long ago, and it's really important. The likelihood that this is not already in place in your organization already is pretty slim, but it happened to us. So your outermost DNS servers or the ones that handle sending requests out to the internet to get names, they should contain catch-all reverse zones um, for local address ranges. So the 192.168, anything 172.16, uh, etc. So services like SSH, when you log into a server, they perform a reverse lookup to uh, give you the, the host name. And if you don't have a reverse DNS entry in place and you don't have these catch-all reverse zones, this query makes it all the way out uh, to the internet. And if you think about it, it doesn't make sense that they should because 10.10.10.10 in our organization would never resolve for the same thing as 10.10.10.10 in your, in your organization. But because this happens, the uh, IANA set up these servers to catch these queries. They're called prisoner, black hole one and two. But because so many organizations don't have this in place, uh, these servers often get overloaded with all these reverse DNS queries that they time out. And depending on your service settings, like for us, SSH would time out before our session could start. So we would try to log into a machine and we would just get kicked out. Because by the time it asks us for our password, the session was already considered invalid. So if you don't have these reverse zones, there's there's not a really good way to, if you, once we show the commands that you can run, if you do a lookup on a reverse, uh, do a reverse lookup on an IP address that's a low IP address, and you either get a timeout or you see a result that comes back from one of these IAN servers, then you're not you're not catching those on the way out. <laughs> so something I wanted to mention, something that uh, it was really quite interesting for us because we couldn't figure out for the longest time what was going on. Like we couldn't connect to any of our Linux servers and you know the security team got involved and it was kind of a, a big ordeal. But it just turned out to be DNS. If any of you know Pam Lefkowitz, she's at the conference, she she says it's always DNS. She has that trademark too. So never thought that DNS could cause something like that. So now that we have that architectural overview covered, um, let's talk a little bit about common scenarios that, that you might see in your environment, starting with Active Directory DNS. Can anyone answer this? Why is using Active Directory DNS such a popular choice? It's the best. It's easy to click. It's easy to click? It allows you to set up otherwise non routable DNS. That too? The reason I think it's so popular is because of this this auto updating of IP addresses, maps, names when you use DHCP. So this never works. It should work. For, for Windows clients, it sh should usually work. Yeah. I'll talk about that in a second. In on and Windows, uh, if you have a, a Windows computer running Windows 7 and uh, you're in a DHCP environment and you've got your computer name, when you get a new DHCP lease, you get a new address, it updates your DNS record so that you don't have to, you can reference your machine by name on your domain instead of by, by IP, right? So Rich said that that broke in, in like 10.6 for, for the Mac, so talk about this slide out of order. And that's because I think it was 2008 R2. Active Directory enabled this secure dynamic update functionality, which OS10 clients don't support. So only Windows clients can securely update their DNS records. Someone on Twitter mentioned that there's a workaround for this using you can have your DHCP server update your uh, your DHCP server update the DNS record on your client's behalf. But I haven't, I haven't looked into that. So I don't know if that's actually true or not. I just know that OS10 clients can't directly securely update there. Uh, their DNS record. So you can turn that functionality off if this is a real pain in your Active Directory environment and you want to be able to reference your machines by name, um, but you have to talk to your security folks and, and weigh the risks and benefits of that to see if it's, if it's worthwhile. If you're using OS10 server in an Active Directory environment, you have to make sure that you have forward and reverse DNS. When you add a record to Active Directory DNS, doesn't automatically make a reverse record for you like OS2 server does. So, 
initially when I set up my first OS 10 server at the university, I said, can you, you know, give me a name? Well, OS 10 server wasn't happy because it didn't have that reverse uh, information. Even more tricky than that is that if you do check the checkbox to make the reverse record, you have to make the reverse zone first in Active Directory. So you can check the box to make a record, but it won't make the record if it doesn't have the zone. So there's a lot of extra steps that have to be done to make sure that that, that works. Another common scenario is round-robin DNS. This simply means one name has multiple IP addresses. Uh, for example, this is accurate as of a few days ago. Initially, there were only two addresses, and then they had the third. Apple.com resolves to these three addresses. So round-robin DNS is a load balancing mechanism used by DNS servers to share and distribute network resource loads. You can use it to rotate all different sorts of uh, record types. And by default, uh, it uses round robins to rotate that order uh, when multiple uh, entries exist for the same name. Is it only for round for load balancing, or can you use it for everything? For just like a record, not. But if you have server, obviously you have multiple entries and multiple MX records, and there's priorities that are signed to those. So, uh, so it provides a simple method for load balancing web servers, other uh, frequently queries that have to be multi-home services that you have elsewhere. Now I want to talk about views or split horizon DNS. This also sounds pretty fancy, but what it means is what you see depends on who you are. So this allows you to use the same DNS servers to provide different results based on the source address of the query. So this is an illustrated example. We have one set of name servers and the line down the middle sort of shows the difference in subnets. And we're asking for hello.example.com from each respective subnet. And you might get 10.10.10.1. Excuse me, you might not get anything at all, or you might get a different address on, on subnet 2. In terms of views, we use this heavily at our, at our organization so that things that are in IT, like uh, load balancers and internal resources, we can reference them by name. But students using the same set of DNS servers can't resolve them. You just define where the uh, source address ranges to return to the result. Is that a move like so? No, you can, you can be very specific. Uh, find supports uh, address ranges, and I'm pretty certain that you can do like, a single single address. I've not tried that, but I assume that it works for ranges so that it for individual address. So let's talk a little bit about troubleshooting DNS. DNS is a three-letter word, um, despite it commonly being a four-letter word. I love this quote from, from Tim in Time Management for Systems Administrators. He says, the strangest problems often turn out to be misconfigured DNS. DNS is critical to so many subsystems, often in obscure ways, that a problem with DNS can mask itself as other problems. This goes for a client that can't reach its DNS servers, as well as a host with invalid DNS data describing it, or a client trying to reach a host with invalid DNS data. So again, back to my like SSH example, you would have never thought that, that would be DNS. It really messed itself in so many different ways. One of the ways that uh, it masks itself is ISPs are evil. Especially in TNT. Especially in TNT. We should start being nicer to them because they might, you know, they might purposely be keeping it or the power of here that we're trying to function. And so ISPs, this is something I want to talk about. Many ISPs these days are playing nasty tricks with DNS that can cause serious problems for you when your Macs are away from your domain. So for example, let's say that your AD domain is ad.school.edu, and it's supposed to be resolvable only internally. At home, though, for many users, because their ISPs um, are using this sort of catch-all system where they, re they redirect bad or unresolvable queries to an ad server, your ad.example.edu might get thrown to this ad server, and your Mac's going to start sending LDAP and Burgos queries there. It's not going to know how to respond to those. It's, it's a web server serving up ads. So this can cause uh, major login delays, various other problems. Fortunately, most ISPs let you opt out of this. Uh, I have Verizon Fios at home, and they tell you you have to go in and change the last octets on DNS servers to up to 
like plus two digits, and then you don't get the you just have the pages anymore. But you can test this really easily. If you go home and just mash on the keyboard and say .com and hit enter, you should get just you know Safari pages since this doesn't exist. If you get a page from Verizon or um, Comcast that says, "Did you mean to type in?" No, I didn't mean to type that, and you're breaking an RFC, so you shouldn't be doing this. But um, you're not going to stop doing it because they're making money off of what a home user does. Oh, yeah, maybe I did mean to click this, but I'll be doing this also this time. And it would be so bad if it's just 480, but across the board. And it's really insane, and I'm trying to log into the machine. And it was just because it was trying to resolve it. And it was getting something back, and it's like, oh, yeah, you can talk to your phone. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I've seen that. Uh, if you use DNS on Windows, yeah, on home directory there, especially if you use not long yet, take forever because exactly. it's it's sending those requests to some server, but it doesn't know how to respond. So it's really important. Um, it's kind of hard to you can't go to all of your users' homes and change their DNS settings, right? There's not a I don't know of a good way of really working around this on like there used to be. Cranky, I think, to manipulate things like this. But so if your users do complain about this, though, you could maybe look for the the article from their ISP that gives them instructions on how to how to change it if needed. Fortunately, though, um, for troubleshooting DNS, OS X includes a vast array of command line tools. The ones we'll look at are NSLOOKUP, POST, DIG, DS Cache Util. SCUtil um, and change IP, which is server, macOS and server only. Um, a tricky part of evaluating DNS in OS X is that many of these utilities are their own resolvers and they don't use the name resolution libraries that are in macOS X. So Safari and other apps might be returning different results than what a, a tool like NSLOOKUP post or name would return. And I'll show that in a second. And OS X is really fond of caching things, um, especially names, for a really long time. So it makes it difficult to see what's going on, and that's where uh, VS Cache Until comes, comes in really handy. So let's look at NSLOOKUP first. It's really easy to use. Um, I should note, it's not on the slide, but I'll note that it was set to be deprecated, but it was sort of set to be deprecated in the same way that defaults is deprecated to write key lists. Like everyone still uses defaults to read and write key lists. So NSLOOKUP, because it's so popular to use, it's not, um, it's not going anywhere you have to, at least not. I don't think it is. The format's really simple. It's just NSLOOKUP followed by the name or the IP address. So if we look up apple.com, you can try this here if you have your laptop. If you type NSLOOKUP.apple.com, you should get these three results, um, unless they change them since I've made the slide. But you can see Apple's using that round robin DNS, so you get three different results for the same name. And if we want to check for reverse DNS, that one says non-authoritative answer because it didn't go all the way out to Apple.com to get. It, it says non-authoritative answer because it's asking. Uh, see, when I did this, it asked my like home DNS server 192.168.1.1, which is uh, it didn't have. It's not authoritative for Apple.com, right? It's, I think it is authoritative for like dot home. Most of the files router to do that, but this was it was returned somewhere somewhere else. If you do NSLOOKUP with one of the IP addresses, they're not all going to give you this nice of a result because Apple uses some of these addresses for multiple things. But this one gave a pretty nice reverse DNS entry there. Post is also its own resolver. So again, th these are not using the name resolution library that are in OS X. So the format for host is also simple. You just host name or IP address. So if we look for apple.com, we see the same three results. The output is a little bit different, but the same three, the same three addresses. Well, you can only do it. Post versus NSLOOKUP. I don't have a reason to use one or the other. I, use, I primarily use Dig, which I'll show. I'll show in a second here. Is Post interactive at all? Like NSLOOKUP, right? NSLOOKUP does have interactive capabilities. I've never used it that way. Uh, I don't know if Post does. I don't think it does. So that, that's like the one that I use NSLOOKUP interactively. So you can change your DNS server. I've never used NS Look at that way, but that is that's available. Um, I don't think that host is. But if we look up the IP address, we get the same same sort of result. This is the reverse entry for for Apple.com. 
Dig is, is my favorite tool uh, to use for troubleshooting DNS when used in combination with DS Apache Kill, which I'll show next. Um, Dig is, is really one of the most powerful DNS troubleshooting tools, uh, but a simple format is just Dig uh, space the name, or Dig space the name space the type of record you're looking for, and I'll show an example of that. If you're doing reverse lookups with Dig, it's Dig-X, followed by the IP address. Another nice feature of Dig, like you just mentioned, that I didn't know you could do that in a plain DNS lookup because I've never done it interactively, but you can specify a specific DNS server with Dig to ask you guys. Uh, a common thing that I do is Dig at Google's DNS servers or even uh, open DNS servers to see if my DNS server could be in the same result as one thousand. And then other useful options you can pass to Dig are plus trace, which will show you the blocking the tree all the way down to the root. Plus short, which literally just gives you uh, an answer and not a bunch of extra output. And then if you run it with no name or IP address, it'll tell you all about the root DNS servers. So here's a here's an output. Uh, I truncated this a little bit, but again, we're just searching dave.apple.com, and we see the uh, apple.com. We're asking in the question section for apple.com, and in the answer section, we get apple.com and the three uh, the three A records. And that first number in the column there is that TTL, that's the cache time in seconds for how long those records are available. So I just mentioned about querying Google. If we wanted to see if, if I wanted to see if my DNS servers are giving me the same results as Google, I can type dig at 8888, which is one of Google's public uh, open DNS servers, apple.com. And there's the question again in the answer section. You can see that we got the same, uh, same results there. Now here's an example. This is uh, Apple actually has this published in one of their uh, Active Directory integration guides. It's to make sure that you have the correct LDAP service records in place for your Active Directory domain. So we type dig and then underscore LDAP dot underscore TCP dot AD dot example that you use, and then we're searching for the type of service. And then you see the question and then the answer, um, and you see the domain controllers listed there on the right. And then you see port 389, I hold that. And then the other two numbers next to that are weight um, and the priority. So results with lower priorities are tried first. In this case, uh, all these three are equal. And then um, weights are used to proportionally load balance things that have the same priority. So in most AD environments, you'll just see them all set to the default, but they may be more complex. But if you're having like random failed logins and you check this, um, and you see an old record for a domain controller that doesn't exist anymore, and you know, also that might be one of the reasons why we make sure that the DNS record gets weird. Here's an example of how you might check to make sure that you have the correct Kerberos uh, service records in place for your active directory domain. Similar to LDAP, but we're looking for uh, Kerberos. And we see the port change in creating an IFU reporting the gate. Between the last slide and this one, I'm surprised that. Uh, I noticed that I'm surprised that our active directory environment is working because LDAP is DC 1, 2, and 3, and Kerberos is 2, 3, and 4. Uh, 4 doesn't exist, so I don't know where that came from. Uh, it should probably be removed now. So DS Cache Util, um, as I said, is one of the only tools that uses OS X's native hostname um, and address resolution query routing mechanism to so the fan page. Formats are a bit odd, like most Apple commands. DS cache util dash q host dash a name, and then the name. And if you're doing reverse, it's DS cache util dash q host dash a underscore IP underscore address followed by the IP address. Only Apple would make something that convoluted to remember. But again, if we look for apple.com, we get the same results, fortunately in this case. Here I am looking for Apple. And then reverse PS cache fill dash Q host A address. And it returned a name that had an alias to the reverse uh, reverse DNS structure. SCUtil um, is a tool that's on OS 10 is used to get or set your host name, computer name, which shows up in like Apple Remote Desktop, and or your local host name. The format for that is SCUtil dash dash get. Any of those three, and if you're setting it, it's dash dash set any of those three followed by what you want to set, um, set that to. So for 
for example, uh, SUTIL dash dash get your name on this machine. It's just configuration. Change IP is included in Mac OS X server only, and it's used to check for that forward conforming reverse DNS uh, entry. It used to be needed to be invoked if you changed your server's IP address or name, but now Apple has a GUI for changing your name and IP address in server.app, and it just initiates this on the back end. You don't have the right to in. The most common usage, though, when you set up a new OS X server is change IP dash check hosting. If you have the right reference in place, you'll get from Apple that looks something like this. It shows the primary address, the current host name, and then uh, it looks up your DNS host name, and if they match, all good. So let's talk about that inconsistent results um, that Apple wouldn't confirm this for me. I asked if you could go know at Apple, but there still seems to be a tight integration between directory services and name resolution. So how do we fix that? Fix that by clearing the DNS cache. Tim talked about this uh, yesterday during the boot camp in the morning about how we shouldn't be having to do this and we should all file bug reports if we have to do this. But these are the two commands that you run simultaneously, or one after the other, rather, will fully clear the DNS cache um, in OS X. DS cache util dash plus cache, and then kill all dash HUP or hub MDM swap. And that second command is case sensitive. So after you kill MDNS responder, you'll see this in system.log. It says you purge the cache. Some other folks that I talked to when I was building this said, is that really still necessary to do? We thought Apple resolved that. Fun fact, Apple helps MDNS responder multiple times when you're setting up a OSM server. So I think that if Apple's doing it, and they're doing it repeatedly, here's two times just in a short uh, short bit of time, then probably important to still, still be done. Speaking of server.app, let's look at DNS in OSM server. So, how are we doing? Okay. When you set up OS10 server, this is the first screen that you see. It says, hey, welcome to OS10 server. It makes it really easy to do things. Um, you get this screen. Choose how your users will access your server. Usually, you would pick domain name. Uh, even if you're on a local network, I think you'd usually pick domain name because you want to give it a, a name. You, can a name. you don't want to use dot .local, dot .private. Just give it a domain name. And then you get this screen. If you get this screen, um, and that hosting field is blank, that means that it couldn't figure out what its host name is. So it did a reverse lookup on its IP address, and it checked for that forward confirmed reverse DNS entry. And if it doesn't populate that field, and it lets you type it. There's also that edit button there that you can make sure that your IP address settings are correct. In this case, we're just using DHCP from, from VMware, and I purposely am not putting in the correct DNS entry here because I want to show you what happens if you don't. So we're back to the screen. And I say, okay, I want to call this machine DNS serve and I want its hosting to be DNS serve dot example dot com. What does OS 10 server do when you type a name in that box and you go through the setup? Well, it's really, really quite clever. Let me go back to slide two. And look at what my current DNS server is. 192.168.157.2. Once I go through this process and type DNS server example.com, OS10 server turns on the DNS service and it makes a primary zone for DNS server.example.com as a reverse entry. And it makes itself authoritative for itself. And it sets the forwarding server to what my DNS server used to be. And in system preferences, it changed my network configuration to be my DNS server's now uh, local host. So it does this because DNS is so important to OS and server that it has to be able to resolve itself. So if you don't have the right names in place and you type something in that box, it does this tricky thing where it makes itself authoritative for itself and then forwards, uh, that forwarding allows you know, queries, other queries to go out. And everything would seem fine from that machine but you couldn't reference that by name from any other computer on your network because it's the only one that knows that. So, uh, okay, real demo. I have to try and hide this and flip. 
very long, so that you can probably have a word for it. Yeah. So this machine is exactly as it was um, in that, that screenshot. So here is that primary zone for dnsserve.example.com. It added an A record, or machine record, for dnsserve.example.com to what the IP address was through DHCP. And it set the name server for that zone equal to itself. It set up that reverse zone, which is the full uh, IP address. And again, the name server for that reverse zone is itself. It set up that forwarder. So what does that what does that mean? It means on this machine, if we run change IP check host name, it's going to say the name's max. There's nothing to change. But if I would try and reference DNS search on example.com from any other machine on the network, I have no idea how to get there. So this is a little, little trick that it plays uh, just because it's so important. So let's look at. Um, a listening server runs find DNS, which uses something called named D. That's the process underneath. So we say which named D. That's in user S then. And it runs bind 983, which is relatively recent. Um, Apple, they, because they compile it themselves, every time they release a listening server, they either choose to keep the release the same or Change. The configuration file for for bind or for the DNS service in um, OS and server is in FC, and that is namedb.com. So I didn't type any of this in. This is all generated by the uh, by OS and server. But if we scroll down here, remember I talked about views. Apple makes one view called public. They don't support in the GUI adding multiple views to split Verizon DNS and that question server is not something that uh, is advised to be done. You could do it through the command line, but um, who's to say what would happen when you open the GUI and it doesn't know how to read those extra views. But in here's the logging information. And then here's that, uh, here are those zones, configuration for the zone. It doesn't allow transfers by default, and then it tells you what file the information stored. So DNS server. So these zone files are in var named D. And you see we have a different uh, a different zone file for each particular zone. So db.dnsserve.com. We take a look at what that looks like. So this basically just has an A record inside of it um, that points to a server to this address. The name server for this zone is itself. Find DNS have these serial numbers which get changed every time you update a name. This is sort of the unique identifier to let any slave DNS servers that you have uh, know that you made a change. The refresh there that's specified, uh, OS and server doesn't let you change uh, a lot of these values. They're, they're mostly default. But that refresh is how uh, how soon should the slave DNS servers contact and check to see if there's an update made? And the retry is if that check fails, okay, try again in an hour. Um, and then that minimum is the minimum PTL for all of the um, records in the zone. So we see that's A100, it's also A100 because it's essentially mid. So I want to show. Oh, the other file in here is this named.ca file, and this is called a root hints file. If we look in there. This has all of the root server information so that this machine knows how to start building caches and how to go out to the internet and start looking for, for names if it can. So in here is just all of the, the 13 root servers in there addressed. And some of them have audio records for, for active music. 
But let's uh, let's keep this as it is for now, and let's say that we want to take uh, control over mac.example.com. Plus and server have this tech box. They add a primary zone. Do mac. This is that minimum. Let me do that minimum TTL. And whether or not we're going to allow the transfers or not, we're not because we don't have a second uh, second machine for this. It doesn't go. There's nothing. There's nothing inside. It. So let's say we want to have uh, test dot mac dot example dot com go to Stuck in the end. <coughs> no, I'm still stuck in the end. This is why you don't do live demos, for us, because the demo gods are dead. The parallel can pull off from this show. There we go. All right, I, I have my mouse back. Okay. So we want to add tests um, with an IP address of, let's just say, 10.10.10.10. .10 .10 .10. Can you guys see this? I don't know. I have machine that's here. Okay. I can't get out of this reach. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. So let's say test. <laughs> let's say test goes to 10, 10, 10. What it did was it added that machine record, but it also said the name server, it uses that first record that you create to be the name server, but that's not correct. We want it to be this machine. So this machine's IP address is this. Yeah, so the name server is dnsserve.example.com. So now we have a mac.example.com zone, which we're authoritative for, because we said the name server is us. And we added a record for test.mac.example.com. We go back into the terminal and look in this, this uh, bar named D. We now have a zone file for mac.example.com. And notice that OS10 server also makes that reverse zone for us. So we have the 10, 10, 10. So if we look in that mac.example.com, We see the name server record, that NS record is dnsserve.example.com, and we added an A record for test.mac.example.com. So in terminal, if we look up NS lookup, even test.mac.com, you get a result. And, 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 and. and notice this doesn't say unauthoritative. If we wanted to do round robin, we could just add, we could say that this is also 10, 10, 10, and pull up. We do that for again. Now we have uh, So this is, this is an easy way. In our environment, the reason that we did the delegation was I didn't want to have to ask our Active Directory domains or even our bind admins. Every time I need to add a printer to the machine that I manage and I want to reference it by name, I don't want to have to ask you for that. So they said, okay, we'll make you mac.army.edu. And I took, they delegated control to me. We're on OS 10 server. I can just go in and click, okay, add a new record for a printer. And I reference it as the printer name. So that's how it works. Something that Apple used to do in 10.6 that they no longer do in DNS is that in this file, or in this directory rather, notice that it's writing directly, server.app is writing directly to the zone files. There used to be zone files that were called, uh, they had .apple at the end of them, right? And the primary one included the .apple one. 
and the server admin used to only write to the .apple, so you can make custom entries in the normal ones without affecting the GUI. But I haven't tried that in, in Mountain Lion. Like, if you add a record in there that you can't add in the GUI, what's going to happen? I don't know. The, the GUI would probably crash because it's not going to know how to read that information. Or it might even overwrite the information that you put in there. So if you want to be able to use views and add additional record types in DNS, maybe file a bug report for that one and say, bring back that, that include system. Yeah, it might do that. I, I don't know. But all the if you if you follow, it's I mean Apple's Apple's being really clever with they wrote a GUI for bind, which is something that's it's not an unimpressive feat, right? Bind if you try and run it on Linux doesn't come with a GUI. Right? And, and server on Apple's a pretty nice GUI. Um, at that it's not quite what it was in ten six, but um, you know, this, this gives you like a decent way to to run DNS. And because we have this forwarded server in here, I don't know if the internet connection is working or not, but I'm wired. So yeah, I can get out to the internet and look up names, even though in system preferences, my network config is my DNS server is set by server.com myself. And that's what that forwarder. I just wanted to briefly talk. Um, we have a decent amount of time left. There's a book uh, called DNS and Bind. It's an O'Reilly book. That's the ISBN number. This is really the most comprehensive document about a book about DNS. It covers it from an architectural standpoint, and then it gets into Bind specifics, which is what Western servers uses, and you know Linux would use Bind almost always. So check that out if you're interested. I wrote an article a while back. Uh, I'll read the title, but it, the link is there. Uh, Wikipedia has really good information about DNS. Microsoft also has a great um, resource so if you're using Active Directory DNS. Um, or even not, they have a lot of the architectural overview information on there as well. And then if you're really geeky and you want to read the, uh, the uh, RFC that defines like the DNS standard, those are also available for you. So that is all that I have. Okay. Yeah. This one? Let's see if I can it. These slides will all be available. I don't know how the conference is going to distribute them, but they, they'll be available somehow. We did have to upload them. These ones, if you want to. So, that's what I had. Um, we're going to take questions if you guys have them. Well, that's a question, but two things um, that probably will help some people. There's what you said about DDNS not working for Mac clients. Um, I'm a happy user of uh, Centrify's AV tools. Their DDNS implementation actually works. It does work. Okay. So one of the big things, benefits that I got out of that is that they work works very well. So if anyone needs that to work, it's free. So. What's it called again? Centrify. Centrify. Does it, does it work control? Is it just, they have that functionality in the free plugin? Yeah, yeah, it's all free. The, the only thing that okay. you don't get the, with the free is the um, group box. That's all it is. So Centrify, free, Active Directory plugin. For places the one that's yeah it, it drops out the Apple one and let's try to do that. Take a look at mammals.org. Mammals. Take a look at mammals.org results. Should I do it? Good. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, these are being <laughs> videoed. <laughs> oh, you think I said it? <laughs> This is the university. It's going to be good. It's going to be blocked every day. It's all printed on the internal street. Yeah. Yeah. So keep it in the video. Yeah. Check that out. So this this resolves to. Did it bring up the web page? Recognize the 17th? Yeah. That's 
sampled internal testing before they release stuff to the public. Mammals.org is where all the other stuff goes up. Very yeah, that was one of the, I think that was one of the addresses, but pages load their normal home, they just go with the normal home page. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the IT thing that I have to offer. That's like the Microsoft. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's more than you think today, but it's more than PSU back at the state that have to run. Yep, that's one of the ones in the list. So that app should just load. Does it load Apple.com? Mm -hmm. Yep. We know that future OSs will be need that for plants now. Maybe for it. It's been like this for about 10 years. Reptiles. Here's mammals.org. Loaded apple.com. That's fun thing. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you guys very much.